Wonderful. Well, welcome, everyone. And thank you, Mike, for the, the introduction. Uh, that's a great panel to follow. I noticed the clock had already already started, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll be quick. Um, so I'm Anthony Hobley. Uh, I was the co-executive director of the Mission Possible Partnership. We now have a, a new uh, CEO, Matt Rogers. Um, but the work that we have been doing at the Mission Possible Partnership is incredibly, it may not seem it at first, but is actually incredibly relevant to this panel. And I was actually very excited to be asked to moderate this panel because we're working with the harder to abate companies, the steel companies, aluminium, cement companies, shipping companies, airlines, trucking companies. And for those companies, their scope one and two emissions are the scope three emissions for many of the companies who are making commitments, who are looking at their supply chains and trying to address scope three. And one of the things we've discovered in our work over the last couple of years is there is no way we're going to decarbonize heavy industry and mobility unless we take a value chain driven approach. We look at how we work right across the value chain from consumers, the consumer facing companies, right the way up the other end to those who are producing the products. We did a a piece of work um, a few years ago as part of the, the World Economic Forum. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about who, you know, who is Mission Possible and who set it up. But the report, the Supply Chain Opportunity, was done as part of the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders with BCG. And it showed very clearly that for companies who produce many primary products and materials, their cost of abatement is very high per tonne of carbon relative to their profits and their turnover. Whereas if you go to the other end of the supply chain, the consumer-facing companies and even the consumers, the cost of abatement per tonne of carbon is, is relatively modest. So this creates a, an amazing opportunity to address the cost, the so-called green premium, of investing in the technologies that we will have to to reduce emissions by taking a supply chain-driven approach and by addressing scope three emissions through the value chain. And this, I think, is one of the topics I think we can explore in this, this conversation as we talk about how we address this. And just very quickly before I introduce this excellent panel, the Mission Possible Partnership was set up a number of years ago, and it's a partnership between the World Economic Forum, the Energy Transitions Commission, the We Mean Business Coalition, and the Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, as I believe they like to be known now. And we are mobilized and working with over 300 companies across seven harder-to-abate material sectors and mobility sectors. And we've been developing a sectoral approach, so roadmaps looking at how, how, you know, how do companies decarbonize year on year between now and 2050 with key milestones. Where does the steel sector or the shipping sector have to be in 2025, 2030, 2035, 2040? It also tells you, you know, what is a low carbon or net zero material in 2025 might not necessarily be one in 2030, you know, as, as you're following that profile. And the same for companies supplying your products. Now, I think to address some of these exciting issues, we, we have this great panel. Um, we have a last minute uh, uh, change on the panel due to COVID. So unfortunately, Tom DeLay, Chief Executive of the Carbon Trust, can't be here. But actually, we have an uh, excellent uh, replacement. So we have Hugh. You're the Managing Director for the Advisory Services at the Carbon Trust. Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> for those who don't know us, the, the Carbon Trust is about 21 years old. For 10 years, it was a, it was a, a, a government-backed UK organisation. But for the last 12 years, we've been a commercial advice and assurance provider to businesses and governments all around the world, helping to accelerate the move to decarbonise the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Hugh. And we also have uh, the Minister um, for Environment yeah. um, for Lithuania. Minister. Yeah, just a pleasure being here. So uh, there's... Uh... Governments are good in regulation, but I believe that uh, decarbonization and circularity can happen only going side by side. Uh, with uh, also speaking both about fiscal mechanism, but also about speaking uh, innovations. And I think uh, governments they play a mission to pay this premium, which is not always absorbed by the by the corporate in the corporate world. <coughs> Wonderful, and Rosanna Elias, who is the I hope I pronounced that properly. Uh, yes, head of Sustainability at Whitbread. Yeah, Head of um, Sustainability at Whitbread. Um, some of you might know Whitbread. We're the uh, biggest um, budget hospitality brand in the UK. We've got about 850 hotels and about 400 restaurants. And I look after our sustainability programme, of which carbon is a, a key factor. 
Wonderful. And last but very, uh, by no means least, uh, Sherry Hinesh, who is the Global Sustainability Services Lead at IBM. Hi, everyone. Uh, Sherry Hinesh. I'm so excited to be here and talk about how IBM is using technology to fundamentally shape and change the world that we share, to help people make better decisions, and to reimagine the world, um, creating something that changes everything. Wonderful. Hugh, if I may, I'm going to start with, with you. Um, and a sort of you know, opening question, I think a fundamental question to this conversation. Why measure your scope three emissions? What does it enable you to do? Great. Well, <clears throat> from a company's point of view, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, the, the first reason to do it is scope three is material. If for the vast majority of organizations, it's between 60 and 95% of overall carbon emissions, which are in, in the company's orbit. And some work we did a few years ago, we, we found that on average, for most of the companies in a quite a large sample, uh, scope three was 11 times greater than scopes one and two combined. So it matters. What can you do about it? Well, I think the second reason to, to uh, get involved in measuring scope three well is that it leads to better decision making. And we, we've got lots and lots of proof points of that. So, for example, it enables you as an organization to focus on perhaps the more carbon intensive areas of your value chain and take action. Uh, secondly, it, it's a really good way of starting to analyze risk and in particular climate related risk and opportunity. Uh, it's a very, really good input for that. Um, and uh, thirdly, and of course that leads to resilience in the long term. And thirdly, uh, it's actually in some ways a gateway to innovation because once you know where some of the future problems are going to lie, that's where you you start thinking about innovation, which is totally necessary to post-transition. We, we can't just get there on incremental reductions. Um, so th those are all the, the main reasons to do it. I would also add a, an extra one, which is when disclosing scope three, this creates transparency. And if you're doing it right, that creates uh, confidence among stakeholders, employees, and of course, investors. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. I'm Minister, I'm going to turn to you next. So. Driving demand and driving your suppliers to address the scope three emissions is also a wonderful way to drive green demand. And in fact, you know, if you are a steel company or a cement company or a manufacturer, you're going to invest. You're going to, you're going to invest and pay more to put technologies in place to address those. You're going to be, build green steel plants or you're going to invest in new types of cement that reduce um, emissions. You want to know that someone's going to buy that lower carbon product, you know, that there is going to be green demand. And one of the things that we've done in the forum, uh, the World Economic Forum recently, is set up this thing called the First Movers Coalition with the US State Department and John Kerry. And that address, that's getting a lot of companies to make commitments from 2030 onwards that they will buy these green products and they'll pay the green premium. But of course, governments are huge buyers. And so green procurement is also a, a potentially huge tool. I, I think, you know, in most countries, for example, Governments buy about half of all building materials, half of all cement and concrete, about a third of all steel. So you know, do you think there's a huge role for governments in addressing scope three emissions and therefore creating this type of green demand in the market? A good question. And uh, I think we have to learn from the history that only by buying the cheapest products, we have uh, had the carbon leakage uh, towards the this continent especially, so uh, when, uh, when the governments are purchasing something and governments sometimes stand for the half of material investments in, in various countries, they have to set an uh, agenda. And I think by mission, uh, uh, the governments are in charge of uh, uh, promoting the standards, uh, paying the premium price uh, for certain products. Uh, we have uh, had uh, carbon leakage, uh, various industries moving out from Europe or United States towards the sweatshops in, uh, in, in Asia and elsewhere, where we have, uh, you know, nightmares. Uh, and uh, that's why when, when we come back, how the governments are purchasing things, and that's where the power is. That's uh, especially in material investments, maybe in some services, yes, uh, hotel brands and also that's where the demand side can be uh, huge, huge power. Minister, thank you. Um, Rosanna, I want to turn to you next. Um, 
And the question I have for you in, in terms of your experience as mm -hmm. a company, um, you know, tackling these issues yes. in, for real, yes. is how do you effectively engage your suppliers? You know, where do you start? Perhaps, I mean, it'd be great to give some examples of, yeah. of where you're doing this in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I suppose when you think about how you're going to effectively engage, you need to know where you're starting from and why you're engaging with which suppliers and what your strategy is going to be, because it's not a blanket approach. Um, and to Hugh's point, it is material and it's vast. I mean, just speaking from um, our experience at Whitbread, we've got our scope one and two collectively is we've, we're on our re um, reduction journey. So we've still got about 50,000 tonnes mm -hmm. in our organisation of scope one and two. Our scope three, which actually Carbon Trust helped us to kind of calculate our baseline, it is, is 10 times that. So it is vast and we know we need to, to address it. We've set our target. So starting with understanding your baseline and where you want to get to. And for us, that's on a 1.5 degree pathway to give the example. So we're getting to 50% reduction by 2035. That's our first target, moving on to 64% by 2050. But taking that first one, you, we know where we want to get to and we know where the carbon is in our scope three. So for us as a hotel and restaurant brand, um, about 40% or so of that is on our F&B. So that would be where we might want to prioritize because you, you, know, you look at the most material areas first. But how you effectively engage will depend on how you want to deal with those particular suppliers. And we're at the beginning of this journey, as I think a lot of companies are. But the way we see it is there are potentially three different routes that you might want to go down and how you might want to engage them with them. There will be some suppliers who are already on this journey, and it's about capturing that data. Because you calculate your baseline and what your target should be based on emissions factors a lot of the time. Some of it's on raw data, but a lot of it might be subject to those market-based emissions data. So emissions factors. So capturing some of the good work that's already there, identifying suppliers who are already on this journey who you could learn from, work with, and kind of capture that um, reduction already. There'll also be suppliers which you want to focus on and support in their journey to mm -hmm. reducing their carbon. Um, so understanding how you can do that, what learnings can you share from your own journey on scope one and two that you can work with them? Are there specific industries and working groups that you can kind of facilitate and support? And then there will be the third category, which is where there will be an accepted amount of carbon, which you almost need to accept the limitations and understand, right, there might be some suppliers where we need to innovate with, rather than just, let's just get down to as much as close to net zero as possible, let's innovate and kind of change, which is where things like data and LCA tools, looking at um, reformulation, for example, of particular products or, or things like that. So it will be a specific strategy and you need to understand why you are talking to supplier X, Y and Z about reduction and how you want to tackle it. So it really is understanding the whole picture before you launch into that engagement, I think. Brilliant. Actually, I want to come back to that in a, in a little mm -hmm. bit because I think this this idea of pathways to net zero, you, you're not, you can't insist that suppliers no. become net zero overnight and, and what yeah. does that look like. But before we do that, you also mentioned data and actually in one of the, the earlier panels we were just listening to the tail end on ESG, it talked about a huge amount of data. I mean, this, this is no different. Mm -hmm. And we're extremely lucky to have a technology company that deals with data, IBM, um, on the panel. So, Sherry, you know, is, is there a hardened link between environmental sustainability and scope three emissions reductions and digital transformation across the supply chains? Absolutely. Uh, we, we recently partnered in some leading research with Oxford Economics and the Institute for Business Value at IBM. And what happens is when you look at three key issues around sustainable transformation, you look at commitment to the board and the CXOs, how this shows up in the products, the communities you serve, uh, in peer benchmarking, and then how it shows up in your technology investments. So the sustainability trailblazers, these are folks who represent about 13% of the 2000 CXOs who were surveyed, and there are ve there's very key focus. I think data is important, and it's beyond data, it's also access, capacity building. It's not enough to just sort of kick the can upstream and, and put these requirements deep in your supply base. It's also, how are you using technology to enable and facilitate, facilitate better decisions? So when we think about what that looks like, it's definitely one of the key um, um, you know, lessons learned from these trailblazers is bringing others along the journey, uh, engaging your supply base, and this is beyond tier zero and tier one, reaching back deeply. Also, recognizing the fact that every system and process 
is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And the reality is, when you think about how complex uh, our global networks are, we've actually designed them this way. We've, we've designed risk into our networks. We've externalized a lot of that risk. And how can we use things like data, AI, data aggregation, using a systems thinking, a systems lens, to get closer to how should we rethink sustainability? How should we rethink the products that we make? We design a lot of ESG-related impacts, 50 to 85% into products, into network and sourcing strategy. So getting really clear, I think one thing that I've taken away just from the first few hours um, on site is there's definitely a compliance lens, um, due diligence lens with ESG reporting. There's also an optimization lens, but you can, you can also optimize for a problem that shouldn't even exist in the first place. I think what we're seeing beyond that and how we're helping customers is the true transformation lens. And that's an end-to-end -end thread connecting a bomb level LCA and enterprise sustainability where they're not divorced from each other, okay? <clears throat> this is not something that lives in Excel silos and we have brilliant people who, who support sustainability organizations who spend three to six months annually in non-value at work, manual tasks, that we could probably automate. The other thing that's really cool about digital and data specifically is it makes sustainability visible. So you have that clear starting point, you have that baseline, and then you can also use exponential, exponential technology to turn those ambitions and that baseline, that benchmark, into action and bring others with you. So that was a long answer. <laughs> I can, can keep going. I'm very passionate. We can have a whole panel just on, on yeah. Data I mean, it's, it's 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 a tremendous opportunity. I think this is what wakes me up out of bed every morning, yeah. and I know that it's possible, you know. And it, but it's not hope, hope. I'm a prisoner of hope, but at the same time, you know, we have to have more than a coalition of the willing. And I think we're going to unpack, you know, yeah. how to use that influence at scale. Exactly, Rosanna. I want to come back to this point you raised, I mean, essentially, it's the, it's the transition, it's the pathways. So if you, as, as a buyer, do you think it's more important to focus in on the specific products and their scope through emissions, or companies who have a, who are on the pathway, who have a credible commitment and a credible, robust plan to, to take them as a company? Um, and one of the reasons I ask this is one of the big pieces of work we're doing in the Mission Possible Partnership over the last years is we've been developing these industry-backed, high-ambition, net-zero roadmaps mm -hmm. for all of the sectors, and then developing sector transition strategies and getting the, the most ambitious companies in the sectors to commit to the milestones in 2025, 2030, 2035. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that, you know, how, how you see that journey? Because it, it, it isn't something that happens overnight. Yeah. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think identifying where you've got people who are already on the journey who you are going to be your um, trailblazers and who can support you on that, but identifying the problem areas that you're going to get stuck and where those trailblazers can effectively help you to unlock the carbon and understanding where the carbon is locked into each product and the processes that need to be changed in order to get to that point. So I'm thinking for us as an example around... Um, our product development, our brand teams, things like that. They embedding carbon decision making processes into everything that they do is going to make it a lot easier to um, unlock the kind of carbon reductions in our supply chains. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question particularly, does it? But I think it is a mixture of the both. And I think for some companies who are able to move forward on this, so I think for for companies like Whitbread, for example, we are a bit of an anomaly in our industry in that we our business model means that we own and manage our hotels and our supply chains. So in terms of pushing forward on the supply chains and understanding what for a hospitality company, those priority areas and the easy wins and getting people to sort of help you lead the way and where the, the challenging points yeah. are going to be, that's something that we could look at both at the same yeah. time. I mean, again, I think, I think it's something we could go on and on talking about, but it, probably the hub is it's a partnership, it's a relationship, yeah, it's, absolutely. A, it's a long-term journey, which maybe is a, it's a different type of market than we, you know, this is more stakeholder capitalism than sort of neoliberal sort mm. of markets we, we've got used to over the last few years. But Hugh, you know, we started with, you know, you, you needing to measure. 
And one of the challenges we have in this, we've had in this space is, is fragmentation and, and no common standards. I mean, it's been a problem in ESG that's only just getting solved. And here, there is no common standard or methodology for measuring carbon. There's lots of people looking at it, but you know, your average, and we, we found this in our circular cars initiative working with the automotive companies, they're saying, well, you know, it, it's not even that there's different methodologies from sector to sector, even in the steel sector or the aluminium sector. The companies all supply steel to them using different methodologies for account for the carbon in, in the steel. I mean, it's, it's a bit like you know, the global economic system having sort of you know, tens and tens of, of accounting standards. I mean, two is bad enough. Um, so do you, how critical is it that we move really quickly to establishing a common standard you know, for measuring carbon through supply chains? And you know, how critical is it to this topic? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good, it's a great question. I think it varies hugely from industry to industry. Um, there are some common standards. I mean, the, the, the GHG protocol scope three standard is widely accepted. I think one of the issues is that supplier data, as you've suggested, is, isn't always uh, in, uh, supplied in a, in, a, um, in a usable way. And actually, technology is going to play a really big part in that, because I think in the pretty near future, we're going to see a lot of and what you might think of as product footprints being aggregated by suppliers automatically to create a more accurate scope three footprint. Um, it's, it's not always that complicated. So I'll just give you an example. In, um, we've been working with a, a, a beef company, quite a high emitting product, as you can imagine. And surprisingly, in, in the UK, there is no system for there's no, no, no common system uh, for showing a footprint of beef. There is one emissions factor for all beef, which is what we're told to use. Um, and there's actually an eight times variability on beef in the UK. So you can get it from one farm eight times more carbon efficient or inefficient than from another. So this company uh, is actually working with, they're investing in about 500 of their farms just to, to create uh, in, in effect, a way of getting better beef data, which can then be shared with the industry. That's a very simple example. There are many, many of those. So, you know, it's a, it really is a step-by-step, sector-by-sector approach to, to make things better. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, I want to come back to you now. I mean, and, and the role of, of governments. Um, I mean, in, I think in this space, you know, you can, you can play a very influential role through regulation, but also through the way you engage in value chains, as, as we've touched on. Which is the most important, or do you think it, it's a combination of the two? Uh, it's um, tango for two. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, on European level, the uh, European Union has is developing this taxonomy, uh, taxonomy ESG re regulation, and there's also labeling, uh, which is coming into power in upcoming years, uh, with every single product labeled how much it emits. But uh, it goes al also on various uh, products like textile strategies, uh, because mm -hmm. textiles is something which is actually, uh, especially the social, social and human rights issues are, are in in, uh, in focus should be. So governments do play a vital role, but uh, not alone. Uh, just take packaging. Uh, packaging is is uh, is a big issue and. Uh, any product, uh, if it depends on producing uh, renew, uh, recycled packaging, it's it's totally dependent on uh, government collection schemes. Uh, whether it's uh, it's uh, a clean product, uh, whether it's recyclable, how much it would cost. So. Uh, we are engaging a lot with Carlsberg, for example. So we all already have on market 100% uh, recycled PET plastic bottles, and it's especially because the government schemes for collection are working well. So it's uh, but the patents had to come from uh, from the academia and the applied sciences. So so yes, uh, there is a, you can regulate, but uh, but it's also you have to to just just also call. For example, in packaging sector, have a certain uh, collection scheme mm -hmm. possible, which uh, gives you clean, uh, clean uh, materials for for further recycling. Minister, thank you. And, and Sherry, I just want to come back to you quickly around. I mean, transparency is incredibly important. People have, to have confidence um, in in the sort of markets we developed in in the measurement in in green, you know, lower carbon products. 
So what role can companies like yours play in helping to address and, and bring that transparency to the market? Transparency is important, and one, I'm super passionate about sustainable supply chains uh, for folks that know me. Um, I think, you know, when you think about credentializing that documented proof of performance, it definitely shows up in the supply chain. Um, what we're finding is visualization, being able to share and articulate through the lens of data that scarring mechanism or how transparent, using blockchain, for example, how transparent are you in your business operations across your value chain end to end? What we're finding is even sharing that information, there's no shortage of large brands that have that you know, thick CSR report that they, that they disclose, lots of disclosures. Does that really get you closer to trust? And that word came up in the last session. And mm -hmm. it's very much about how you can demonstrate and prove that you're a good corporate citizen. But I think there's also a very human element to that, and that's the experience. So how can you use data, use transparency in a way where people feel like they're fundamentally making a difference by choosing your brand? There's elements of loyalty, um, you know, brand preferentiation, but then also using sustainability as a transformation catalyst. So that shows up in your values, Certainly the employee experience, how you engage your suppliers, why people choose you, choose to do business with you. And that's something that really gets me excited because it's beyond transparency, it's trust, it's experience. And if you look at that continuum that we've all been describing, you know, there's due diligence, there's compliance, there's optimization, there's transformation, there's innovation, and then there's trust, which is a really human mm. feeling. And that's, that's what what I think is at the heart of, of how ethical innovation and some of the work that I lead at IBM, how we can truly make a difference and leave no one behind in the journey. Exactly, we'll leave no one behind is important. And on that note, I think we have just under five minutes. We can take a few questions. Um, so there's one here at, at the front. So, and, if, and who you might want to address that question to? <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Michael from Green Cheddar. Um, really interesting talk. Thank you. I'm quite interested in your opinion on double counting because um, some scope one or two emissions for one business might be scope three for another. Um, sorry. Who wants to take the double counting question? You're looking at you. me. Um, <laughs> well, all I would say on that is. Um, you're not supposed to add all the scope threes together, right? They are, they are a view of an individual organization. And yes, absolutely, one organization scope three will be another organization scope one and two. Um, the, I personally don't have a problem with that because it enables each organization to focus on where they can be material. I think there are still some issues with regard to, getting quite technical here, the national allocation plans and the, the, some of the rules that have just been come out of the last COP to do with, particularly with the, the way that um, offsets are going to be discounted against um, national plans. But I think that's a separate issue. I think as far as scope three goes, there is some criticism that what's the point of this? If you add it all up, it doesn't make sense. We would say don't add it up. Just look at it from an individual company's point of view. It's driven some pretty tough looking targets. You know, any company with a net zero target now basically has a a 90% scope three reduction target by 2050. That's the framework. I would encourage organizations, we would encourage organizations to look at the actual really positive um, outcomes from having scope three uh, numbers, which are, as I said earlier, around better decision making, which ultimately will lead towards those targets. Mm. I think it's interesting, you know, it, it, is it instigating, is doing this actually instigating the change that's needed, the investment decisions, the, the investments in, in clean technology, the you know, moving companies or sectors down those pathways. And I think that's ultimately, you know, probably the measure of success. Yes. Right. Um, are there any uh, oh good, we've got several. Mm -hmm. We've got two well, let's take these two questions here, maybe the one over there, maybe just because of the time we can uh, we'll bunch them and see if we can answer them in a rapid fire um, <laughs> hey. Why? So my question is, you know, most sustainable reporting happens at a corporate level, which is good to share, but, uh, you know, it takes a lot of interpretation to, to make it actionable. So what are your views in making this information available at operational level, you know, where 
day to day decision making can actually be done by having a sustainability dimension added to it. And how do you do it? I mean, what are your views on this? So the corporate level reporting of the gentleman here. Question around, do you see a path? Thank you. Do you see a pathway to global standardised accounting practice for Scope Three emissions? So a pathway to global standardised accounting for carbon emissions. And then there was a question here, and we'll have to finish it there. Do you want to shout? experienced a lot of success in this collection scheme, so I was just curious what you put that down to. Is that down to you know, campaigns run by the government? Is that down to public-private cooperation? Just very curious to hear that, uh, that success story. So. Brilliant. All right. So who wants to take the corporate Quest the corporate reporting. Bit. Yeah, why don't you do that? Yeah, sure. So if I understood it correctly, it's around how you operationalize it rather than corporate level reporting, actually making it kind of live and breathe in there. So um, there are a few different ways you can do that and trying to truly embed it within the whole operation. And I can, I suppose, talk from experience with, with our hotel um, brand. So we make sure that it's in incentivization from the top and throughout the organization. So um, our CEOs, for example, um, uh, remuneration package, etc., linked to our carbon target, linking it in that way, um, and at site level, making sure that it's through the incentivization and the understanding and training as to how we run our sites, that there is a proportionate amount of where we need to get to in our scope one and two allocated to each site. We have we have um, our it's a win card we call it. So every site understands, and then it's down to the core sustainability team, my team, and the energy teams to support them in understanding what they can do and just that regular communication on what we're doing. This is down to you. This proportion is down to this area. Thank you so much. And this site has done X amount, sharing good practice amongst them and really living and breathing it and making it everyone's responsibility, not just the core sustainability team's responsibility. Brilliant. And the, the question about a pathway to a global accounting carbon standard. No. We sorry, we're looking at you again. Uh, um, so, <laughs> I mean, I, I think this was mentioned earlier that we shouldn't let um, not having global standards impede progress and that there is an urgency that we have to start now. Yeah, I mean, we would say there is a standard. It's As I said earlier, it's a GHG protocol. The issues with it are that the, 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 the move from the standard to the reporting is not always clear. Um, there are quite a lot of optional aspects to it in the standard to do with indirect, um, indirect use of products, for example, and there could probably be more guidance around that. But I think most of all, it's the quality of the, of the work that's done itself. And in general, I mean, again, getting quite sort of geeky here, using spend-based data gives you a very inaccurate picture. Using quantity-based data gives you a far more accurate picture. And if more organizations can move to that, they will have better data. Um, and the, I think the guidance around the existing standard will also um, develop. Brilliant. And Minister, you get the final, you get the final one closing <laughs> word. Just uh, maybe a suggestion for everybody when you speak about decarbonization, think not in the linear economy terms, but in a circular economy terms, because, for example, in packaging, uh, if it's recycled packaging, then it already emits three times less in certain areas, uh, uh, CO2 emissions. But uh, from, from packaging to packaging, of course, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a product uh, like uh, glass, which is, uh, can be recycled a lot, and uh, there's plastic products like uh, can be recycled three, three, four times, and it's still uh, microplastics is a negative effect of that. So there's a, there's a huge topic, but just I want to stress, think of decarbonization in a circular economy terms because it's it's much faster, it's more socially uh, resilient, and uh, it's less material demanding, which is uh, we are still living in a linear economy, not a circular economy. Minister, thank you. And if you would please join me, this has been a great panel. It's been a privilege to moderate. Thank you.